Last week, I blood tested for the fourth time in 2021. So with that in mind, what's my biological age? So here we're looking at uh, data for Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator, uh, which is a metric of biological age. So without going through each uh, variable uh, individually, uh, we can see that the net effect of these nine biomarkers is that my biological age is about 13 years younger than my chronological. Now, uh, this isn't the only biological age test that we can use that's freely available, and another is aging.ai. So what is my biological age using aging.ai? So here we're looking at the 19 biomarkers for uh, aging.ai, and based on the, uh, that data, we can see that my predicted age is 31 years old, which is uh, about 17 and a half years younger than my chronological age. So then the obvious question should be, or could be, what's contributing to my relatively youthful biological age? So in terms of supplements, um, and these are the supplements that correspond to the 43-day period in between blood tests. So my last blood test was on July 21st. Uh, so my la latest blood test was on September 2nd. So that period in between blood tests is 43 days. Uh, and my supplements that I took during that period are the same as for my last blood test, uh, levothyroxine. I was di diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my 20s, so I've been taking that for about 20 years. And then I'm taking methyl B12 to help limit my homocysteine levels, which have a tendency to, to increase, which they increase during aging, so I'm trying to limit that. But note that for, the, for my next blood test, I removed the methyl B12 supplement, and I'll get into that a little bit more later in this video, and I'll actually have a separate video on why I'm gonna do that, but uh, for the, at least for the next blood test, I'm gonna take it out and see what effect it has on my homocysteine levels. All right, what about fitness stats? So my body weight uh, for this dietary period, for this 43-day period that corresponds to the blood test from last week, uh, is about the same as for my last blood test. So 156.7 was the last uh, body weight. So it's about, a, it's a tenth uh, heavier. So essentially the same. Uh, accordingly, my BMI is similar, 24.6. It was 24.5 last time. And then my cardiovascular health related metrics, resting heart rate, RHR, and heart rate variability, HRV. Uh, so we can see that my resting heart rate uh, went down uh, 1.1 beats per minute since the last blood test, again, 43 days ago and my heart rate variability uh, increased. So it went up about five and a half milliseconds. And these are favorable changes because uh, we want our resting heart rates to go down, but increase heart rate variability. And that will be going in the right direction in terms of cardiovascular uh, fitness related metrics. Now, what, Im what impact did these improvements, these relatively small improvements for resting heart rate and heart rate variability have on biological age? And as we can see, based on my previous uh, biological age for Levine's test, 35.3, and aging.ai, which was 29, one could argue that the improvements, these relatively small improvements for resting heart rate and heart rate variability didn't impact my biological age at all. So with that in mind, what's my diet? And I haven't done a full diet breakdown in probably about a year, so uh, it's, it's about time we get into that. So uh, just real quick, it's important to note that this is my average daily dietary intake for that 43-day period, July 21st through September 1st, so the day before the blood test. And uh, I weigh all my food with a food scale, and that's every day without fail. And then I enter those food amounts into uh, online software, free software, uh, Chronometer, and I'm not sponsored by them, so you can use anything. My Fitness Pal has a similar uh, approach. There may be other tools, online tools that one, one can use, but that's what I use. And then the output data, including macro and micronutrients and individual food amounts, I then enter those into a spreadsheet. And then with enough data for diet, fitness metrics, and blood biomarkers, and note that I have now 32 blood tests since 2015, I can then investigate which aspects of this approach can impact, and then correspondingly, can I optimize the blood biomarkers? And then I expect that approach will minimize disease risk and maximize longevity. So the food intake. Now, I've got this uh, in three columns. So on the left is the rank in grams. So I've ranked these... Uh, in numerical order from one to 26, and I have a second half of that from 27 to 52, but in terms of how much of each food do I eat, I've got them ranked in order, numerical order. All right, so then the individual foods in the middle column, and then the amount that I ate in grams, ounces, or calories. And to be consistent, I, everything is mostly in grams, but there are a few on this list that are in ounces, like green tea is in ounces, and there's some other stuff that may be in calories. I'll, I'll note that in a second. So. Uh, what is my diet mostly comprised of? And atop the list are carrots. And uh, obviously carrots, as indicated by their name, are carotenoid rich. 
Now, carrots aren't the only carotenoid-rich food that I uh, eat. As you can see by the red arrows, I have other carotenoid-rich foods, including spinach, red bell peppers, watermelon, avocado, and tomato are prominent within the top 11 foods that I eat on a daily basis. So why carotenoid-rich foods? And I presented this in another video, but if you've missed it, for a quick review on that, relatively higher blood levels of carotenoids are associated with a younger biological age. And in this case, it was epigenetic age, so DNA uh, Grimm age, uh, DNA methylation by the Grimm age metric. So this is blood levels of carotenoids, which we can see there, and the N is the sample size. So this was in a study of about 2,300 people. The bicore is the correlation for blood levels of carotenoids with epigenetic age, and then the p-value is indicative of statistical signific signific si sorry, significance for all of these uh, carotenoids. So it isn't just the total sum of all the carotenoids in blood that was correlated with a younger epigenetic age, which is shown there, but each of the individual carotenoids, like, including lycopene, alpha and beta carotene, lutein and zeaxanthin, and beta cryptoxanthin. So higher intakes, or, or higher intakes of those would be expected to result in higher blood levels of those uh, carotenoids, and correspondingly, that may impact epigenetic age uh, or Im impact a more youthful epigenetic age. So with that in mind, I, I go for coverage for each of these carotenoids in my diet. Lycopene, including watermelon and tomatoes, alpha and beta carotene, spinach and carrots, lutein and zeaxanthin, again spinach, and then beta cryptoxanthin, which I get from red bell peppers. Now, other uh, foods that are prominent on my list are strawberries, uh, coming in at second place. And strawberries are a rich source of Fisetin, which has been shown to extend both average and mi maximal lifespan in mice, and that's what's shown here. So we're looking at percent survival plotted against age on the x-axis. And when compared to the median survival in the uh, control diet, which contained no fi Fisetin, we can see that the Fisetin uh, fed mice, supplemented mice, had both that increase in average uh, or median lifespan and also in maximal lifespan, as shown there by the shifting uh, in the right curves, uh, the red curves to the right. So other, other foods that are prominent in my diet are blackberries and parsley. And um, one reason for that is because they are sources of dietary CD38 inhibitors. Uh, curamanin, which inhibits CD38, is found in blackberries. And apigenin, as I'm sure we all know, is found in parsley. And this is fresh parsley that I eat, uh, average, an average of 47 grams per day fresh parsley uh, every day. So why dietary CD38 inhibitors? And I've also uh, some videos on this on my channel, so if you're interested in more info, this is just a quick summary of that, so please check it out if you're interested. But as we can see, NAD levels decline during aging, and one reason for that is because CD38 levels increase, and CD38 is a NADase, which means that it's a NAD-degrading protein. Now, CD38 inhibitors can correspondingly inhi inhibit CD38, and these inhibitors include apigenin and curamanin, which I mentioned are found in parsley and blackberries, respectively. And that would be expected to increase NAD or at least slow the age-related uh, NAD decline. Now, I haven't measured NAD, so until then, I think it's a prudent strategy to include uh, some of these CD38, dietary CD38 inhibitors rather than none in my diet. Now, also last on the list that just uh, popped up with the red arrow is cheesecake. Now, you know, obviously, if you look at the 26 foods, it looks relatively clean. But uh, notice that I do have cheesecake there, and that's not eating a little bit of cheesecake every day. What I usually do is after I get my blood tested on that day, I have a cheat meal or a cheat day, however you want to call it. I'm really not a fan of that term, cheat meal and cheat day. A celebratory meal, I don't know, just something to uh, something that I feel like eating. And on that day, it was cheesecake. So I had a big piece of cheesecake uh, from the Cheesecake Factory. And you know, that, uh, that 29 calories per day is actually over that 43-day span. So it was like a 1,400-calorie piece of cheesecake. Now, it wasn't just cheesecake that I had on that day. We can also see that I had M&Ms on that day. But then, you know, whereas some people may uh, have cheat meals uh, daily or, or weekly, uh, I try to limit this to once per dietary period at most. So this was the only, um, you know, processed slash junk food that I had during that 43-day period in between blood tests one slice of cheesecake, and a bag of M&Ms. So that's my uh, dietary intake. What about my diet composition, including total calorie intake, uh, you know, protein, fat, and carb uh, composition? So uh, starting from the top, we can see that my total calorie intake for this dietary period that corresponds to the blood test that I got done last week was about 2,500 calories. And then in terms of the percentages of carbs, fats, or, or lipids, and protein, during that period, it was 41% carbohydrate, 40, about 42% from fats, and 17% from protein. Now, I'm just going to highlight a, a few aspects of uh, my 
my intake here. And I should note that again, this is the average intake. This isn't one day before the test or a week before the, before the test. This is my average dietary intake for the whole 43 day period that corresponds to the blood test. So first we can see that the, my average fiber intake during this period was about 87 grams per day. And that's purposefully high in order to optimize the gut microbiome. And for more info on that, I also have many videos on uh, the ability of fiber to optimize the gut microbiome. And I'll leave that in the right corner if you're interested to check it out. All right, other things that I'm paying uh, uh, close attention to are total fructose intake. So sucrose, which is also indicated there by the red arrow, is comprised of 50% fructose. So if you combine that 50% of about 37 with the 56 and a half grams of fructose, you get to about 75 grams of fructose per day, which does seem like a lot. Uh, I eat a lot of fruit, but that's actually on the low end of my range for me. And I'm trying to shoot for a little bit lower, but I love fruit and uh, you know, I eat a lot of berries. So that's where it's coming from. And the reason I, I'm keeping an eye on my fructose intake and trying to shoot for lower, the lower end of my range, it's because relatively higher levels of fructose in my data is correlated with lower LDL. I mean, values as low as 40 or below. So I've got to keep a close eye on that because I want to get it to uh, about 50 or higher, which is what has been shown to be uh, associated with maximally reduced uh, all-cause mortality risk. And I also have a video on that. So if you're interested in that, check it out. All right, also on this list is uh, omega-6. And in my data, I haven't mentioned this before in other videos, but relatively higher uh, levels of omega-6, dietary omega-6, and are correlated with higher homocysteine, which is going in the wrong direction. So for this blood test coming up for the next one, I intend to take out the B12, the methyl B12, to limit my omega-6 intake. And that's coming from most, you know, I mean, it's exclusively whole foods. These aren't from omega-6 rich oils. It's mostly walnuts and pecans that I'm getting my omega-6 content. So I'm gonna try to shoot for less than 10 grams per day. I'll probably end up somewhere around seven or eight grams per day. Uh, and we'll see if it actually plays some role in impacting my homocysteine levels. All right, what about vitamins and minerals? And again, this is the average vitamin and mineral intake over that 43 day period that corresponds to my latest blood test. So just some highlights. And again, I have videos for all of these. So if you're interested in more, uh, please check it out. So first notice the beta carotene intake, which is uh, 58,000 micrograms. So that's about 58 milligrams per day. In my data, relatively higher levels of beta carotene are associated with higher albumin and higher albumin is found in youth and is associated with a reduced all-cause mortality risk. So I shoot for relatively high levels of beta carotene every day. I'll also note of uh, my vitamin C intake. So the RDA is somewhere around, or it's actually less than about 100 milligrams per day. So for this dietary period, it was about 600 milligrams per day. So that's six times the RDA. And one reason for that is because uh, there is a meta-analysis that's been uh, uh, shown to, uh, that, that there's a dose response for higher blood levels of vitamin C with reduced all-cause mortality risk. Now, what the upper limit is, should I, should I take in 1,000 milligrams per day? I don't know, but for now, it's at least six times the RDA. Now, also higher than the RDA or what's been defined as an adequate intake is my vitamin K intake. And the adequate intake, AI, for vitamin K is about 100, 100 micrograms per day, um, maybe 120, somewhere around there, depending on if you're a man or a woman. So I'm, I'm about 19 times higher than that. And the re one reason for that is because there is data that suggests that vitamin K intakes greater than 1,000 micrograms per day. And again, I have a video on that. If you're interested in that data, please check it out. So I shoot for relatively high intakes of vitamin K, including green leafy vegetables like spinach. All right, so in terms of my average daily mineral content, we can see that here. And just to highlight, we can see my selenium intake at about 182 micrograms per day. And I also have a video on that um, showing that selenium intakes up to about 200 micrograms per day may be optimal. So that's my upper limit. Uh, it, you know, so I've got about 182 micrograms per day of selenium for this uh, blood test. All right, so as a last note, uh, by tracking diet in conjunction with blood biomarkers, I believe uh, I'm working towards identifying the diet composition and the macro and micronutrient amounts that best optimize the composite of blood biomarkers, not just glucose or triglycerides or lipid panel or kidney function, but the net of all of them, which would be expected to maximize health and potentially longevity. All right, that's all I've got for now. Uh, if you're interested in more, you can check us out on Patreon. Uh, thanks for watching and have a great day.